Your Majesty, Your Excellencies, dear prize winners, and ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this great ceremony, the Kavli Prize in Nanoscience, Astrophysics, and Neuroscience. The Kavli Prize is a partnership between the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the Kavli Foundation, and the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The prize was initiated and funded by the late Mr. Fred Kavli and is today awarded for the sixth time. Fred Kavli established the prize with Norway in order, as he said, to advance science for the benefit of humanity and to promote public understanding and support for scientists and their work. The prizes were first awarded in 2008, so that makes this the 10th anniversary of the Kavli Prize. And you knew Fred Kavli, didn't you? I did, I knew Fred. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think that this award really embodies his own personal drive for increased knowledge, new knowledge, and a striving for excellence. And that's something you could say about all of science itself, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. And speaking of excellence, how about that accordion player, that young accordion player? Wasn't he wonderful? <laughs> Young Matthias Rugsvein. 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 Yes. Rugsvein. yes. That's what I That's said. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, ladies and gentlemen, is only 14 years old. Did you know that? He was 14 years yes. old. Is youth really wasted on the young? Uh, do you wish you were 14 again? Me? No, no. I love my birthdays. The higher the number, the better. <laughs> No, really, I, I expect to live forever, and so far I'm right on schedule. <laughs> and you know, Fred Kavli started out quite young too. In fact, he was only 13 when he started his first company. That's right, he was. And he was from a little village called Eresfjord. It's on a fjord in the west of Norway, I'm told. And he moved to the U.S. in his 20s, but he remained Norwegian his whole life. It was in the States where he became successful as an inventor and a businessman. And that's where he collected the resources to pursue this, this wonderful quest to make science as important as it should be. His enormous enthusiasm for science. Well, we are now going to meet an artist who in some ways is Fred Kavli's opposite. You see, in his 20s, he moved from the States into Norway, where he blossomed as an artist and experienced great success topped by being voted Norway's best entertainer last year. And here he is with a piece of really good advice for us in our contentious times. Adam Douglas with Try a Little Tenderness. Young 
young girls, they don't forget it. Cause they Now on to the first prize. The Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters has established three international selection committees, with members coming from China, France, Germany, the United States, and Great Britain. And it is they who have decided this year's winners of the Kavli Prize. Each of the three prizes consists of a diploma, a gold medal, and $1 million in US dollars. And the first prize, will be for nanoscience. Ever since we discovered the double helix of DNA and how it stores information, we have lived with the promise of genetic modification. We have uh, dreamed of rewriting the language of life itself. And with the discovery of CRISPR some years ago, we found a new powerful writing tool. CRISPR-Cas9 is a kind of molecular scalpel that can make a precise cut in exactly the part of a, the strand of a DNA where you want to uh, change the genome. So this is a new tool that has tremendous advantages for solving the problems of diseases, of genetic diseases. But more than that, it's also showing promise in agriculture. So from feeding a hungry world to making advances in battling genetic diseases, this is a tool that it will change the world. It is and time to honor three scientists with a Kavli Prize in nanoscience. Shortly, the chairman of the committee, Professor Arne Brattos, will justify the award, but now it's time to meet the laureates. Emmanuel Charpentier, Jennifer Dodna, and Virgnis Schicksnis. Many big discoveries in molecular biology happened by trying to find answers to very basic biological questions. And, and the ba very basic biological question that we are trying to address in my lab actually is how bacteria uh, defend themselves against viruses and uh, how different antiviral defense systems in bacteria function. We look at molecular mechanisms. We are trying to understand what are molecules uh, and, and proteins in, in bacteria that actually provide uh, this interference against invading uh, viruses. 
Microbiology has really been at the origin of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology because this is through the understanding of certain mechanisms existing in bacteria and also existing in viruses that we could develop all the technologies that have been used over the last uh, 50 years in molecular biology and also in genetics. CRISPR is an acronym that stands for Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. It's a big mouthful, but basically what it means is a place in the bacterial DNA where cells are able to store genetic sequences that come from viruses. So they, they keep a genetic record of past infection. It's a fantastic way that bugs can acquire immunity to viruses. And it also turns out to be a powerful technology for controlling genomes because the enzymes, the proteins that are part of these CRISPR systems are effectively programmable DNA cutting proteins. In a simple way, CRISPR-Cas9 is to be seen as a kind of, of scissors that are programmed to recognize a, a certain sequence on, on the genome of any type of, of cells and organisms. And these scissors will, uh, will cleave the DNA and this will trigger a genome modification at the site uh, uh, expected to be, to be modified on the genome. I think what makes the CRISPR-Cas9 technology unique and, and truly revolutionary is the way it works. It's, a, it's a, a, a technology that works by recognizing a short sequence of DNA using a, a chemical copy of DNA called RNA. And cells will naturally uh, make RNA molecules that program the Cas9 protein to find and destroy viral DNA. Scientists, now that we understand how it works, we can actually make our own uh, pieces of RNA that direct Cas9 to any desired DNA sequence. Now there is uh, for sure a tremendous potential in, in just research and development to uh, use uh, genome editing to, and to understand the functions of genes in human cells, uh, to be able to develop novel anti-infectives by finding uh, new targets for for therapeutics by developing models of, of diseases that are more clinically uh, relevant. Cas9 could be used to correct uh, mistakes in the DNA that cause genetic disease and uh, this could help us to, to uh, actually cure genetic disease that were incurable for, uh, for a long time. Cas9 technology also can uh, allow us to introduce different changes in the DNA. This is important also in an agrobio field because new uh, plant varieties could be engineered that actually could be resistant for, for uh, pests or droughts or, or other in environmental uh, factors. And it's easy to do, so it makes it trivial to make uh, new tools for any part of the genome where a change is desired. I really do hope uh, that with regard to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology that it will uh, reveal to be successful to treat at least uh, certain uh, human genetic disorders and that it will have really brought uh, really uh, a plus in, uh, in the treatment, whether it's by, uh, with a direct application or indirect application in the overall field of, of biomedicine, really for the treatment of, uh, of uh, various types of diseases. To change DNA is to alter the underlying code for any living organism. Repairing a defect in the genome of any creature, one would have to remove, change, or insert genetic code at atomically precise locations in DNA. With the advent of the truly revolutionary nanotool CRISPR-Cas9, the door to curing hereditary diseases and boosting agriculture creaks open a little further. Until now, genetic engineering was slow, imprecise, and costly. CRISPR-Cas9 enables editing DNA similar to how we can modify a manuscript. The system acts like nano-scissors that cut DNA in incredibly precise ways by targeting a single letter, and this allows the potential correction of disease-causing mutations. 
It's a tool that works on many organisms, plants, fungi, animals, including humans. There are many advantages to CRISPR-Cas9. It is simple and quick to use and highly robust. A small RNA molecule is synthesized to encode the location of the DNA sequence to be modified. This attaches to Cas9 protein to form a complex which binds to the target DNA. Cas9 then opens and cleaves the DNA at exactly the desired location. As the segments reconnect, DNA may be inserted or altered. The breakthrough of CRISPR-Cas9 builds on the discovery and exploration of CRISPR. It's an acronym that stands for Cluster Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, a DNA sequence used by the immune system of bacteria against viral attacks. With our teams, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, and independently, Virginia Sixnish, invented a way to combine and develop CRISPR and Cas9 into a powerful nanotool. Their pioneering work and further great advances by a growing number of researchers continues to unleash the enormous potential of CRISPR-Cas9 in experimental biology. It not only offers tremendous opportunities, but also carries responsibilities and risks that affect all humankind. Profound ethical challenges must be addressed and resolved. CRISPR-Cas9 creates new scientific capabilities for positive innovations. Possible benefits are wide-ranging in scope and value. From a fundamental perspective, it's an ingenious technique for basic research that will enable the detailed study of the genetics of many previously intractable organisms. In terms of applications, CRISPR will be used to develop agriculture with regard to changing crops and livestock or increasing biodiversity. In medicine, attempts to correct disease-causing mutations have already begun. And soon, this will be expanded to grave conditions such as muscular dystrophy, sickle cell anemia, and some forms of blindness and cancer. The CRISPR-Cas nanotool initiates a revolution in genetic engineering with limitless potential benefits and pressing ethical challenges. Rayleigh has a novel technique presented such an opportunity to radically change almost all branches of the biological sciences. I now ask the three laureates to come forward and receive the Cavalier Prize in Nanoscience from His Majesty King Harold. I guess most Americans tend to think of Norwegians as smart, healthy, gorgeous, and blonde. <laughs> I'm sorry for the stereotype. But at least in one case, it's actually true if you add in an amazing ability, an amazing talent for music. And I'm speaking of Elbjörg Hemsing. Elbjörg Hemsing, at the age of 28, is already an international star traveling all over the world, making appearances, winning prizes. And today, she's going to play with Hovar Gimsa, the Mazurek by Antonin Dvorak. Thank you. 
reasons that are still hard to understand. We live in a universe where the cycle of birth, life and death can be seen everywhere. We know it as humans and we see it in the nature and in the skies above us. Planets, stars and galaxies are all born, live for a while and then die. A lot of people don't realize that there are molecules out there in space and yet those molecules 
are the basis of planets and stars and solar systems. They're the building blocks of these things. And molecules like carbon, carbon monoxide drift through the universe, interstellar drifting. And they form the basis of life itself. They form the basis of the planets and the stars and the solar systems. This year, the Kavli Prize Committee for Astrophysics has chosen to honor a true pioneer in the field of cosmic chemistry, a scientist who for decades has advanced our knowledge of interstellar molecules, how they form and how they are destroyed. In a minute, the chairman of the Committee on Astrophysics, Professor Mats Carlson, will justify the award, but now it's time to meet our laureate, Avinam van Dieshoek. there be life elsewhere in the universe? Well, if you want to answer that question, you first have to understand how and where water is formed and how much there is, because water is one of the key ingredients for life as we know it. And what we have learned over the past decades through our observations, through our models, through our laboratory experiments, is that water is formed already on those tiny little dust grains in those dark clouds even before the collapse of that cloud to form a new star like our sun and then a planetary system. Astrochemistry is the formation, destruction, excitation of molecules in different astronomical environments. Um, but it is actually so much more than that because we can use molecules also as a probe of physical conditions, as a measure of the temperature and the density. Um, also, the molecules themselves affect the structure and the evolution of clouds by being the main coolants of the gas. And then, indeed, uh, the whole story about the origin of stars and planets. But the space between the stars is not empty, but it's filled with a very, very dilute gas, only about one atom per cubic centimeter. That is much more empty than anything we can make on Earth in terms of an ultra hair vacuum. But that makes interstellar space also such a fantastic chemical laboratory because we can study chemical processes under conditions that are very different from those that we normally encounter here on Earth. For millions of years, these clouds are stable, but then a small part of them can start to collapse under its own weight. That's also what happens with our own sun. It basically originated from a cloud like this. And they are so dark because they contain tiny little dust particles, a little bit like the sand grains that you have on the beach, but then about a thousand times smaller. And the dust grains are very important because they absorb and scatter the light, so they protect the molecules inside the clouds, but also because they play a role in making new molecules, especially water and organic molecules. To me, it's one continuing story. We started from the large scales of the clouds, then we collapsed the clouds to form protostars and the protoplanetary disks. Now, with ALMA, we are able to zoom in into those disks and see actually the regions where likely, at this very moment, giant planets are forming. My dream for the next decade is to zoom in even further, to go very close to the mother star where the terrestrial planets are likely forming, planets like our own Earth, and to study the chemical composition there. And that will actually be possible with the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope and also the extremely large telescopes that are built on the ground. They have the ability to zoom in onto that inner region. We live in a universe where molecules play a key role in the physical processes that lead to the formation of stars, planets, and life. Observing these molecules also allows astronomers to probe cold and obscured interstellar clouds 
in the Milky Way and other galaxies. Our understanding of cosmic chemistry has been revolutionized by a combination of measurements with new observatories and space telescopes, laboratory experiments, and theoretical studies. Among the researchers who have contributed to this revolution, Evine van Dijsselk is outstanding. Among the many advances made by van Dijsselk and her collaborators are seminal contrib contributions to our understanding of the formation and destruction of interstellar molecules. Their pioneering work on carbon monoxide has been essential for elucidating the evolution of the cold components of the interstellar medium from diffuse to dense clouds in the Milky Way, as well as cold star-forming gas in galaxies across cosmic time. Through laboratory experiments, Van Dijsselk's team has advanced a quantitative understanding of the growth and evolution of interstellar ice. This work includes investigations of photoprocessing of ices composed of water, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. Such studies serve as a basis for modeling the effects of photodesorption and processing of astrophysical ice. These are key steps in the evolution of molecular clouds and the subsequent formation of stars, protoplanetary disks, and planets. This work also helps to reveal the chemical evolution of our solar system, where comets and primitive meteoritic materials preserve the composition of the original cloud of gas and dust. Recently, Van Dijsselk and colleagues have extended this approach in an effort to connect the chemical composition of the comet 67P visited by the Rosetta mission with that of young stellar systems similar to our own. Evine van Dijsselk has masterfully applied spectroscopic tools across a broad range of wavelengths with a superb exploitation of the most powerful astronomical measurement techniques. She used the Infrared Space Observatory to study molecules previously not accessible by microwave spectroscopy. She used the Herschel Space Observatory to follow the trail of water throughout star formation. And most recently, she used the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array to provide the first view of dust traps in disks around young stars, which put observational constraints on planet formation theories. These examples illustrate the remarkable breadth of her approach to fundamental astronomical problems, embracing cutting-edge observations, physical and chemical theory, and laboratory experiments. Evine van Dijsselk is leading the transformation of astrochemistry into a growing quantitative discipline. I now ask Evine van Dijsselk to come forward and receive the Kavli Prize in Astrophysics from His Majesty King Harald. One more award coming up, but first we'd like you to meet the chairman of the board of the Kavli Foundation. Please welcome Mr. Rockel Hankin. Your Majesty, Ministers, Excellencies, Kavli Laureates, ladies and gentlemen. Ten years ago, and almost to the day, Fred Kavli stood in this hall and said to the very first Kavli Prize laureates, let these prizes be a token of thanks and gratitude for moving us along the path of greater understanding of the human being, nature, and the universe. Today, I'd like to express that same deep appreciation to the seven extraordinary scientists we're honoring this year. These are women and men who fundamentally advanced 
our understanding of science at its biggest, its smallest, and its most complex. In neuroscience, this year's laureates revealed the remarkable way that sound transforms in the ear, then reaches the brain, such that even the finest notes in a symphony can be discerned, along with deepening our understanding of how our senses engage the world, it's propelled new insights into hearing loss and deafness. And in nanoscience, by discovering a way to surgically edit DNA, our three laureates have given us the ability to alter the world and ourselves in ways once unfathomable. Indeed, thanks to the technology they created, we can now truly explore DNA's potential for addressing problems ranging from hereditary diseases to food shortages. And finally, in astrophysics, this year's laureate has given us a truer understanding of the dynamic role molecules play in the formation of interstellar clouds, stars, and planets. This is not only at the core of better understanding the chemistry of the universe. As noted by the International Astronomical Union, it's at the core of understanding the mechanisms of molecules crucial for life as we know it. All of this is science at its best, science that expands what we know, what we can do, what we can one day achieve. This is science that makes a difference in all our lives. Today is also a milestone. On the prize's 10-year anniversary, we have now had the immense honor of celebrating 47 extraordinary scientists. Indeed, in this very hall, we have had the privilege of honoring researchers who have opened our eyes to an expanding universe, uncovered the intricacies of human memory, and created unprecedented methods for controlling matter. And that touches on just a handful of those laureates. And in the true spirit of these international prizes, these scientists come from around the world. The United States to Russia, Netherlands to Japan. Science knows no boundaries. Recipients of these prizes are determined by independent juries. Uh, around the world, under the leadership of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, we are especially appreciative to all who participate in the selection of our prize recipients. Our prize winners have advanced science for the good of all humanity, and at the Kavli Foundation, that has special meaning. Our core mission is to advance science for the benefit of humanity, and much of this mission is realized through a worldwide community of Kavli Institutes doing basic research. Through these research institutes, we routinely witness the drive, imagination, risk-taking, and determination needed for pioneering science. And daily, we are reminded of the dedication and sacrifice by the scientists behind each new scientific discovery. So it was with particular pleasure I congratulate this year's recipients of our prize, whose achievements come at a time when science continues to be so critical to advancing our lives in the world. Thank you all for joining us here to celebrate the remarkable achievements. And on behalf of everyone at the Cavalry Foundation, I thank His Majesty, the King, for his participation in the ceremony, his own tremendous support of science, and for presenting the Cavalry Prizes to our distinguished laureates. The last prize is in the field of neuroscience, or in common language, the brain. Now, a malfunctioning brain can be a serious problem, yet we tend to say a lot, you're crazy. That's not a very scientific expression, but it's a good song title. So, here is one of Norway's leading vocalists for decades, Solveig Slettajel with Crazy.
With our limited understanding of it, the universe itself can sometimes seem crazy and chaotic. But the Connolly Prize focuses on three aspects, looks at this tangled web of nature through three different lenses, and taken together, they give us a little clearer view. Fred Connolly stated that the Connolly Prizes are in the fields of the smallest... Nanoscience. The largest... Astrophysics. And the most complex... Neuroscience. And we have left to celebrate that most complex part of our bodies, the brain. The human body works in mysterious ways. We, we often take its complexity for granted. I mean, for instance, take hearing. I hear you. Oh, oh, good. And that's because the inner ear, your inner ear, is taking in these sound waves and transmitting them, turning them into electrical signals that give meaning to words that get the sounds from my mouth into your head. And wait a minute, I've got it here. I've got my ad lib here somewhere. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, oh, right, yes. Yeah, that's because that's what's, ha what's happening in your inner ear where sound waves are converted into electrical signals. And the area of the body that I'm talking about has been the subject the focus of this year's winners for their discovery in the science of hearing. Mm. It's time to honor three scientists with the Kavli Prize in Neuroscience. In a minute, the chairman of the Committee in Neuroscience, Professor Ole Petter Uttersen, will justify the award. But now it's time to meet the laureates. A. James Hudspeth, Robert Ferriplace, and Christine Petit. Excellent, look at that. That's amazing. So there we're measuring movements of, uh, you know, 10 nanometers. Isn't that amazing? Can you see it? So, two direction. Can you see it there? And that's the movement of the, of the hairs. So we're actually projecting the hairs onto a diode and then looking at the light on the diodes and that's showing the movement. I work on hair cells. These are sensory cells in the ear, in the, in, inside the ear, that detect sound and they detect also motion of the head and, uh, and acceleration. But the ones we work on detect sound and we're interested in how they detect sound, that is how the sound is converted into electrical signals and how they uh, distinguish between different pitches or different frequencies in the sound. It's like a prism. In the light prism, you, you shine white light onto the, onto the prism, and this then breaks up the different colors, and you can project them, as Newton showed. The, the, the cochlea behaves like an acoustic prism, where you could input wideband noise, which has got all frequencies in it, and the hair cells will separate the frequencies along the cochlea. So low frequencies are present at one end, and high frequencies are present at the other. The ear is not just passive. It doesn't just receive sound. It actually has an amplifier built into it. So the amplifier makes sound louder by 100 to 1,000 times. It sharpens our frequency sensitivity. It gives us a very broad dynamic range so we can hear everything from dropped pen to a jet plane taking off. When the basilar membrane is set into motion, the 16,000 hair cells along its length are stimulated mechanically. The hair bundles, which are the tiny clusters of filament protruding from the top of the hair cells, begin to oscillate back and forth. And the hair bundles have, between each of the fine filaments, a sort of a filament called the tip link. And that tip link is attached to ion channels that can open and close. 
So every time you hear a sound, the cells that respond move back and forth. And as they do, the little gates open and close, letting ions flow into the cell and setting up an electrical response. That electrical response is then propagated across a so-called chemical synapse to the nerve fiber that carries the information into the brain. The real turning point in my work was the development of the huge investment of the scientific community to try to decipher the human genome and especially to decipher the human genome analysis. I got very interested in the auditory system because this is a sense for communication in humans through language and music. Basically, we hear with only a few thousand sensory cells. And this precluded in a biochemical or even classical molecular genetic approach to be able to identify the key molecule involved in sound processing. But in such a situation, the genetic approach is perfectly appropriate because its efficacy is completely independent of the number of molecule or cell being involved in a given process. I am very much interested now by the cortical process, how sound is processed at the cortical level. I would like especially to focus on auditory um, cortex plasticity because, of course, we need to restore hearing at the peripheral level. But brain plasticity is absolutely essential to take advantage from this restoration. Without brain plasticity, the result will be very poor. I would say our research has two long-term goals. The first one is rather abstract, which is understanding at a molecular level exactly how the ear operates, how the channels operate, how the little strings, the tip links attached to them operate, and so on. The other goal is at the other extreme, which is trying to deal with deafness by regenerating hair cells so that people will no longer have the problems associated with different kinds of hearing loss. As I speak to you now, you are engaging an incredibly sophisticated sense that we sometimes underappreciate, yet is central to our daily lives. Hearing the sense of hearing. We can hear frequencies from 20 hertz to 20,000, discern the pitch of 1 30th of the difference between two piano keys, and detect signals that vibrate over eardrums by one billionth of a millimeter. Uniquely among our sensory organs, the ear converts sound, pressure waves in the air, into electrical activity, and in doing so, transforms sounds into signals that the brain can record, that we can grasp as speech, enjoy as music, or disregard as noise. The three Kavli Prize laureates have used complementary approaches to unravel the mechanisms by which the inner ear processes sound via sensory receptors called hair cells. James Hudspeth has provided the major framework for our understanding of the transduction of sound into neural signals. Extending from each hair cell is a bundle of fine protrusions that act as sensors. Hudspeth used ingenious methods to reveal how sound-induced vibrations evoke an electrical response in the hair cells via a direct mechanical connection between the hair bundle and ion channels. Critical to hearing, his work also revealed how sound signals, which can be very weak, are strongly amplified within the inner ear. Robert Fetty Place has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of sound transduction and demonstrated that each hair cell is sensitive to a specific range of sound frequencies. His experiments revealed that hair cells are organized in a pattern that reflects their frequency selectivity. 
using sensitive physiological measurements and theoretical modeling, he discovered that this selectivity reflects an intrinsic electrical property of the cell. This is set by the density and kinetics of its ion channels and induces a resonance at a particular frequency. Christine Petit has explored the genetics of hereditary deafness in humans and identified more than 20 genes that are required for hearing and inner ear development. She elucidated the mechanisms through which these mutations cause hearing defects, thus illuminating the unique biology of hair cells. In the clinic, her work has helped improve deafness diagnosis and subsequent counseling. Several of the genes she identified form major components of the hair cell machinery that converts sound waves to electrical activity. Collectively, the breakthroughs made by this year's Kavli Prize laureates have unveiled the molecular and cellular mechanisms that underlie hearing and that underlie deafness. In doing so, they have shined light on the sense that allows us to enjoy music and to listen to each other. Their work serves as a sterling example of how concerted efforts across disciplines can revolutionize our understanding of complex neurobiological processes. I will now ask the three laureates to come forward and receive the Kavli Prize in Neuroscience from His Majesty King Harald. That was the final Kavli Prize of 2018. It's been a pleasure to take part in this extraordinary ceremony with you and to celebrate the first decade of the Kavli Prize. And now it's time to sum it all up. Please welcome on stage the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, Ole Seierstedt. Your Majesty, Excellencies, Ministers, Mayor, Laureates, and Friends of Science. Today we are honoring scientists who have pursued their convictions and made breakthrough discoveries. The knowledge they have provided makes us understand more of the world we live in. When we look closer, the work of the prize winners in the three categories is in fact linked. It's all about molecules. Evine van Dieshoek has studied the chemistry that causes stars and planets to form, without which there would be no life. Emmanuel Charpentier, Jennifer Doudna, and Virginius Schixnis have studied the basic molecules of life that contain the information required to build and sustain the living world, and has given us a tool to edit that information. James Hertzbeth, Robert Fettiplace, and Christine Petit have studied molecules that make it possible for us to sense the sounds of the world around us and transform the sound waves into something we consciously experience. To me, it's truly fascinating that chemistry permeates so different fields of research. The prize winners have made observations and performed experiments, followed by an intellectual tour de force to make the new facts and data comprehensible and they have linked them to knowledge that we already have. This new information expands on our knowledge 
to the benefit of us all. The best proof that scientific development really benefits us all is the growth and prosperity of modern societies. Unfortunately, the European Court of Justice has recently made a decision that will hinder the use of gene editing with the method discovered by our laureates to provide better crops to feed the growing population of the world. In recent years, science and the scientific process have come under attack. Believe it or not, fake science is, grow is a growing industry. Predatory journals flourish, meaningless and expensive meetings are arranged, and it is possible to publish pure fantasy under the flag of science, since there is no scrutiny or peer review of the scientific content. Unfortunately, some scientists fell, fall prey to this industry, since they believe they can get easy publications that promote their careers. To some extent, they have reasons to believe this, since many institutions measure their attainment and progress and calculate added value with little focus on quality. Hence, we should not be surprised that also people outside the scientific community become skeptical. The scientific community definitely has a challenge to restore and maintain its commitment to true knowledge. In light of this, I'm extremely thankful to our selection committees. They have a very important task in selecting our laureates. They make sure that the science we honor fulfills all the criteria of quality and reproducibility that is core to the scientific process. The prizes are meant to attract attention and show the public how important scientific activity is for our society and its future. We are especially hopeful that new generations will become inspired by the work of our laureates and that they will follow in their footsteps, build on their discoveries and promote true knowledge. I'm therefore happy to once again ask the laureates to come up to the podium to receive a final round of applause.